everybody handed their passports in and um, lo and behold I was refused so <laughs> dad was very proud you'd have 15 co 15 dishes for lunch and it's like oh, why I'm dying <laughs> you know but uh, sounds horrendous if you're prepared to work hard uh, and and you know put your head down the world's your oyster you know there's you can do whatever you want Welcome back to the Chef JKP podcast. And on the show today, we have one of the most celebrated chefs within the region. You all know him, the legend that is, Colin Clegg. Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you for the invite. So, first things first, favorite or first ever childhood food memory? Fish in the Isle of Man. What type of fish? Oh, it would have been... Uh... Well, kippers is in there, obviously, herring, you know, all that sort of stuff. Cod. I remember my grandfather going out in his, we had a, a rowing boat. He made some murderers, you know, which are totally illegal. You know, just <laughs> lead weights was lost. And in them days, you could get, you know, six or seven cod in one, in one line, you know. So, so when you were growing up there in the Isle of Man, for anyone who doesn't know the Isle of Man, mm. where is it located exactly? It's right in the middle of the Irish Sea. It's... Uh, principality i suppose you know it's not part of the united kingdom it's an independent uh, country uh, crown dependency it's called um so we are independent and it's a bit like scotland a bit like england a bit like wales and a bit like ireland it is paradise and In the so i can imagine the coastline mm. being super rich how, how was that for you as a kid growing up F phenomenal i mean you if you stand in the middle of the isle of man you're no more than six miles from the sea. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 12 miles at its widest. Uh, so obviously all the fishing boats go out, you get fantastic, we've got legendary uh, queenies, you know, the small scallops. Yes. So sweet, so beautiful, the fish is fantastic. But then in the mainland, oh, sorry, in the, you know, the island itself, the lamb, everything is fantastic. Really? It, it was really a lot of, you, you didn't think about it, but it was organic and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it was just what we grew up with, you know. My dad had an allotment; all his vegetables was grown. So, so were, were you were you helping your dad also with the allotment no. as a kid, or not really? No. <laughs> so, just eating. So, as as growing up, were you super interested in food, or did you want to take a, a sort of different path career wise? Well, my mum is a cook. You know, she's got the same city and girls qualifications as I had, and that's what she trained to do. Uh, and obviously then when my brother and I came along, she went into school meals and all that sort of stuff. So we all had the same holidays and, and things like that. So I was always, we didn't have much, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, we just a regular working class family. But we always ate well. I mean, dad growing his own vegetables and, and all that sort of stuff. It was, you know, farm to table every day, you know. But that, that was real farm to table, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, you knew the people that were growing it, you know. That must have been amazing. That was fantastic. I, I, I was truly blessed. I mean, to be born on the Isle of Man, I ticked all the boxes. I was lucky as uh, can be. So then, in your, during your teenage mm -hmm. years, um, were you interested in food, or, or did you have a, did you want to do something completely different, or was it just a, a natural step for you? Uh, I remember going to see uh, my Arthur Fife. His name was. He was my um, careers teacher, and he says, "Let's face it, Colin." You're not going to uni, are you? Which was a quite, oh, quite blunt. Lovely. <laughs> quite blunt. But I mean, we're still friends today. I mean, um, What's his name? Arthur Fife. Arthur Fife. Okay, thank yeah. you, Arthur, for the beautiful advice. But uh, I always wanted, there's two stories that we can go down here. I always wanted to be an archaeologist, but nobody told me you really had to be quite brainy. I'm very, very good at history and all that sort of stuff. I still, you know, that's my passion today. Um, but maths, forget it, physics, all the stuff that you really need to get into university, it wasn't going to happen. But um, so I thought, and I've got two passions, traveling the world, like yourself, traveling the world and cookery. So I thought I'm going to be a chef in the Royal Navy. So I applied, um, you know, passed the exams, everything. There was no problem. Then I went over to Mount Pleasant, which is in Liverpool, and had the medical there. I did everything, the eyes, ears, all that sort of stuff. Then I stood on a scale. 
and I was about eight stone. And uh, you know what Liverpudlians are like. Mm. I could play a piano concerto on your ribcage, that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I failed that because I was too skinny. So he said, go home, eat Scouse, drink Guinness, put some weight on. So that's what I did. I grew about another foot, didn't put hardly any more weight on. <laughs> so I was even skinnier than when I started. And um, but, but by that time, I think the, the notion of serving in the army or the, you know, had gone. I just wanted to be a chef. Okay. So as soon as I finished um, catering college on the Isle of Man, went straight to London. So... Before we talk about London, mm -hmm. catering college was how long? Two, two years. Two years. And but I, I had started, uh, you know, as I say, we didn't, we, working class. So from 14 years, I was washing pots in the hotel, right. Ocean Castle, Okay. Uh, you know, for a guy called Stanley Kane. Um, washing dishes, then slowly he let me do a bit of breakfast and all that. He always said to me, you should go front of house because, you know, but it was never for me. Ah, so, so, so you naturally had a career path anyways. Yeah, yeah. Doing that. I mean, the Isle of Man obviously was summer seasons. Mm. And, you know, it's a typical coastal British place. Tourism was very big. Not so much now, but, you know, when I was growing up a long time ago, it was uh, the thing to do. So, yeah, we all had summer jobs just to make ends meet. Okay. So then by the time you enrolled into college, you already had experience. Yeah. Um, and uh, during that two years, it was all culinary or did you have to do... Food and beverage. We did, you know, the thing. usual thing. Uh, hygiene was in there, bakery, patisserie, uh, food service was in there. Uh, you know, I didn't excel at that, obviously, and uh, said a few things. And most of the time I was washing the pots instead of being the waiter. <laughs> so even then it was a cheeky one. But um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I have to say about my time at college was the, the lecturer was a guy called Bernie Ogle, who sadly passed away now. Um, I thought he was the most evil man on the planet. There's no doubt about it. For two years, uh, he made my life and another friend of mine, Eddie Kane, our life's hell. Because we, we were the two guys that said, we're going to be chefs. You know, other people wanted to be managers and all, and all that sort of stuff, but we were going to be chefs. And uh, he made my life hell. You know, he'd thump you, he'd kick you if you were two minutes into, into in, yeah. Really? But he, until he died, he was the first person I saw on the Isle of Man every time. I, st I owe him so much. I mean, he was an absolute, and still is a legend. So, yeah. so he sort of he sort of shaped you to go into yeah. the industry and to prepare you for what eighties London for, was like. Yes, yes. So, so then, talking of eighties London, yeah. Obviously, what sort of, what sort of, uh, and those kitchens back then, obviously they're nowhere near to how they are these days. That's a good thing. Which is a good thing. Yeah. But but for you back then, how was that experience? I mean, coming. I mean, let, let's put it into into context here. You're coming from a beautiful place, mm -hmm. Isle of Man. Yeah. Surrounded by beautiful nature, oh, yeah. family, friends, everything is there. Mm. To then do extensive travel. Yeah. To go into this metropolis. It, I'd never been on an escalator type of thing, you know. I'd never, obviously, a tube train. I mean, the trains on the Isle of Man are steam trains, so, you know. <laughs> Uh, so it was it was a it was a culture shock right yeah and i don't want to bring this but when i was growing up in the island man everybody was white it was just yeah. you were english irish you right, know that right, sort right, of right, right. we had no ethnic diversity right. which we, which we have now you, uh -huh. know, a, you know so when i got to london it was just like you know multiculturalism straight at you yeah but then your first job yeah where was it i took the first job well uh, you know, I heard Nick, you know, and he was saying about he used to send all his letters out. I must have sent handwritten because my mum insisted on like 50 letters. Oh, wow. Uh, and I got about two or three yeses. And one was not the greatest. I mean, it's the Strand Palace Hotel in London. But the reason I took it was the um, staff accommodation was basically right behind the hotel. So you lived in Covent Garden. Oh, nice. Exactly. Yeah, that was that was the thing. And um, so that was that's the reason we took that, and then obviously a few things happened. So, so then let's let's put a fly in the wall. Mm. What was a typical day like at that hotel at that time for you? That hotel wasn't bad. That was just a, a step in the door. I think it was a four star or something. You know, the hours were long, but the chef wasn't particularly um, uh, melodramatic, violent, or whatever right, you right, right, we're right, going to call right, it. Right. But further down the line, obviously, you know, the Trocadero, Gary Hollyhead, people like this. I mean, um, 
those were hard. I mean, I remember going to work for Gary and I said, what are the shifts? And he said, I said, early's, late's? And he goes, yes. So I presumed it was early's and late's. No, it was early's and late's. So you're going in about 7.30 in the morning, finishing at midnight. And Saturday was a half day. That was 12 till 12. As a half day? <laughs> As a half day. 12 hours was a half day. And it was at the time he was going through the, you know, him and Marco were competing. And there was an article in the paper. It was like, you know, who was the... English enfant terrible, you know, type of thing. Right. And yeah, it was interesting. But working in a, in a, in a kitchen like that, quite high level with mm. Gary. Yeah, it was a Michelin star. That was, it, yeah. How was the pressure? Well, if you know Gary then, I mean, he's a fabulous chef. Absolutely, he always was. But obviously then, you know, the whole conditions that, were, you know, um, it was in Soho and you'd order minimal stuff and you'd, you'd, uh, you run out of stuff, you know. So you're in, there was always a little <laughs> cup at the end of the table with money in it. And when you run out of, so say, carrots or leek, you run down to the market, you know, the one in, in, in Soho there, buy some leeks and carrots and all that, and run back. During service? Well, in the daytime. Right, well, okay, okay. God, okay. if you run out in service, just don't, say. don't come back. Right. But, um, but he did the ordering, so it's his own fault, you know what I mean? Um, and you'd run back with two bags of shopping or whatever in your chef's whites and Soho being Soho in them days. It's a <laughs> live show inside, sir. So do you know who my boss is? I mean, you'll skin me alive. Like, you know? But, uh, yeah. But, but it, was, it was tough, I mean. But I can imagine, because obviously none of the things that we discussed now uh, were there then. So let's, you know, mental health, um, staff well-being. That sort of thing didn't exist. Well, it was you. Well, you were just expected to get the job done, whatever it takes. Yeah. If you don't like it, see you later. I mean, the stories I know of, you know, people burning themselves badly on their foot and leg, you know, with oil and that, and finishing service with their, you know, their feet in a bucket of ice type of thing. Then going to the hospital and all that sort of stuff. They they really were terror. Not. In one side, there were terrible times. There were, you know, misogyny, uh, you know, violence and all that. But on the other side, the camaraderie, you know, we're all in the same boat together. Mm. I mean, I don't know what's going. Uh, we'll probably talk about that later where the, the restaurant scene's going now. But then it was difficult, but I enjoyed every minute. But of I it. think you, the, the, the reason why you sort of got through it is because, as you said, you had that camaraderie. Mm. Everybody's mm. going through it. Yeah. At the same time, Anybody who's ever worked in London, there yeah. is a there is a vibe to working yeah, yeah, in London. Yeah. Um, so it's it is tough. I mean, obviously, I'm you know getting on a bit, but a lot of my friends didn't make it. You know, didn't come through the other side. They've left the industry, as you said. There's mental health issues. There were drug abuse issues. You know, alcoholism. All these things. Um, so we don't want to go back to that. There's certainly no way we can go back to that. Um, but there are things that, you know, if you want to be the next Jason or the next Gordon right. or anything that, doing seven and a half hours a day and taking weekends off is not going to get you where they have achieved. And the only way to do that is hard work. That's well, it. The other thing I wanted to sort of touch upon is um, specifically Australia, mm. UK, US, the system for education mm. is you do your two years and during that two years, there's also work experience Ooh, that you, yeah. you know, work or there are cases. And um, certainly when I was uh, in college, one day at college, mm. four days a week, five days a week working. Yeah. And you learnt on the job mm. and got paid. Yeah. Which is really cool. Um, but I think specifically within the UAE, mm. that, that would be massively beneficial for everybody. Yeah. Because at the moment, as you know, there are qualifications that you pay for within three mm. months or six months, and then you're already a chef. Yeah. What's your thoughts but, on that? Well, when I graduated, so I did the two years full time. I mean, as I say, when I lived there, it was 60,000 people on the Isle of Man. Um, you come out of two years, yeah, I got a tall hat, I've got my nose, I'm a chef. But then you started as a third commie, and then to a second and to a first. So to get to a chef to party was probably six or seven years. Right. You know, you really did a long apprentice. You basically you were so wet behind the ears. You started at the bottom, and you really had to work your way through. What's happening now is they come out of college, and and you know I think don't mention politics, but getting rid of seventy uh, you know city and guilds was a disaster. 
you know, they don't, certainly in Britain, they don't teach them how to bone meat anymore or fish because they buy that in type of thing. So they're coming out as a chef thinking that they know everything and, um, you know, can't fillet fish or bone bone legs of lamb or anything like that. So are Those skills are so... I mean, you need them for life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that my so my my father was the one who pushed me to be a chef. Yeah, because he said have a you need to have a trade. Mm. He said if you have a trade, if you're good with your hands, you can do anything. Yeah. So you know, um, it wasn't plumber, it wasn't mechanic, yeah. it wasn't carpenter. Yeah. But you look at th- those trades. You you can't push or cheat your way through those no, trades. You can't no, take no, shortcuts. No. But you're right. And after college, you become the apprentice. Yeah. You know, until you prove yourself. Yeah. Right? I always remember going to, uh, I was in the Halcyon Hotel in London with James Robbins, and they did a fabulous game terrine, so, but it was only made by Michel, who was the Dutch sous chef. And I went to him, what's in there? Oh, nice things. That was it. Had, <laughs> that was, it, was all, it was all secrets. But then you had to peer over his shoulder, learn how to make it the hard way. So that took you three months, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But look, then after London, what was Ooh. the catalyst for you to go and travel to Australia? I'll be eternally grateful for this gentleman. What it was, I did. I wanted to travel. I'd met a few Australians in London, obviously. Every bar, you know, mm, as you do. the bar, the, ba- the barman was always Australian. So I went to Australia House, and I, I said to the gentleman, "Years working holiday," which is what you could do then. And he said, "Look, chefs are on the list. Pay an extra fifty quid, and you can be a resident." So I was a resident of Australia before I ever landed there. Oh wow! Yeah, so. Obviously, then after five years, they asked me to be a citizen. There were a few reasons I didn't. Another three years, still I wouldn't do it. And then they said I could uh, swear allegiance to the people in the Commonwealth of Australia. So I took it, you know. So I got an Australian passport now. But uh, it was absolutely fantastic, Australia. I mean, it's just Melbourne is the greatest city I've ever lived in in my life. So how different Mm -hmm. is the culture or the food culture in Australia compared to Britain? Obviously, it's nearly 25 years since I I left Australia. But what I noticed when I first got there, and I think this is basically carried through um, my career since since London. I mean, some of the chefs that I've worked with will probably say now he's lying. But I've really calmed down. And um, I went to Australia. Obviously, you know, you've worked for some of these chefs and been abused and been treated mm. badly. And said, right now, it's my turn. I'm going because there's people below me, so I'm going to give it to them. And you get to Australia and you start doing your London restaurant. Show. Oh, mate, calm down, mate. We don't do that here. And, you know, don't talk to you know. <laughs> so they, they just didn't take it. So I was I missed out on all the fun part, really. Um, but I think that's what it is, and it, it it was. And when I was there, I mean, the Australians kept all the best stuff. Right. I mean, the, the ingredients were second to none. I mean, absolutely. I remember remember one story. There's a fish in Australia called Orange Ruffy, you know. And apparently it takes about 80 years to grow to a decent size. And the Aussies were fishing out of the water like there was no tomorrow. I think it's not allowed now or something like that. But, you know, the chef, go and get the Orange Ruffy from the fridge. Obviously, it's... Does it look orange? Does it egg? You know? <laughs> so I come back, you know, <laughs> and then he still still starts throwing stuff around. So But then so but you worked in, in Sydney and yeah. Melbourne. And Hayman Island and in the ba- Hayman Island. In the Barrier Reef. Yeah. So what a phenomenal journey. Yeah. Specifically you touched upon Melbourne. Mm. And for those people who haven't travelled to Melbourne, it is the mecca of food. In Australia. In yeah. Australia. Yeah. How was the scene back then for you? It, it, it was it was fantastic. Obviously, we're talking you know thirty thirty five years ago, so it's gone on to bigger and better things mm. now. Although you know obviously with the recession, it's struggling a bit now. Yeah. Um, but I always say Sydney's a bit more like an America. Okay. You know that sort of young, but by Melbourne is definitely more European. There's a huge coffee culture, which I don't drink obviously, but the restaurant scene was great. The Chinatown. I mean, there was a restaurant called the Flower Drum, Gilbert Lau. Unbelievable unbelievable it's still there today um so the food scene was excellent you I mean you're surrounded on the outside but you know the yarra valley and all the wineries and all that sort of stuff uh yeah it must have been phenomenal it was it was and the standard of living you could get was far it's like here it it, it was far superior to what i could get in london so suddenly you're not doing the 16 17 hour days and um 
you got a nice flat to live in. You know, you walk to work. Nice. It, it was just. Yeah, the there. weather's all right. Yeah. Well, Melbourne's not. Uh, Mel Melbourne's not Sydney. I mean, there's Four Seasons. Yes, you know? exactly. It's I still mean, nice, no? Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, but I like Four Seasons. Yeah. I like a bit of rain. Well, if you didn't like rain, you wouldn't live on the Isle of Man, <laughs> would you? you know? So, but what would you say that Australia taught you the most w when it comes to your leadership style? Yeah, I think it, I calmed down rapidly because you know treat people fairly, expect to be treated as as you you know want to be treated mm -hmm. yourself probably goes down through camaraderie was there i mean i just i had a friend an irish friend over who i worked with in sydney and we spent you know a couple of days together while they were in um uh, in uh, dubai so those friends that you make are for life you know so you've been through the trenches and now you've come out the other side okay exactly you, you know so then colin what i really want to get on to is in the opening mm. or the pre-opening of mm. the Burj Al Arab because just before that time mm. you worked for one of I would say one of the most iconic chefs of our time yeah. a gentleman called Anton Mossiman who is still with us who is still with us yep. uh, eccentric guy always wears a bow tie won't like doesn't like garlic in food which we put lots of it in there lovely and, exactly lovely um, tell me about that gig specifically with him. Well, that was a, that, that was just basically um, I was waiting for the Burj. It got delayed, so I was doing basically the outside uh, catering for for him. So you know, in London, in London, you'd go to you know various fine houses and all that sort of stuff. But one particular case, we were meant to go to um, Highgrove House and cook for Prince Charles uh, and Lady Diana. That, but uh, everybody handed their passports in, and um, lo and behold, I was refused. So, <laughs> Dad was very proud. You know? why, why is that? Oh, a few political things oh, in my youth, you know. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's butt. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then, once uh, Burj Al Arab had opened, t tell me, tell me again. So, so because this was. 1999. 1999. Mm. The Burj Al Arab was just about to open. Yeah. When did you first go in to Burj Al Arab? Um, so I got there in 90, probably end of 98. I mean, we were actually doing a lot of work in the Jumeirah Beach and, right. and crossing the bridge every day in the sun, you know. Um, it was a good four or five, six months before we actually opened the doors when we were there. And in that time, the you know, they, they didn't really know what type of food in each house. They said, do the menu for an Australian type of thing and then modern British and, you know. So now, now they've settled on it and it's obviously a fabulous place. But then it was uh, revolving doors, you know. But back then, your brief um, was one restaurant? Yes. Oh, what? yeah. No, I was in charge of Al, uh, Al, Al Muntaha. Muntaha. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, all, not, not rooftop restaurant, but it's yeah. the, the, the yeah. highest. Yeah. Beautiful. The time, the Times described it. I remember as a newspaper in a dog's mouth. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful there! Uh... Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the, the right. shape and the gosh, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's very yeah. um, creative of them to. to well, to sometimes they some can manage a bit of journalism. But tell me about that time because it is to this day one of the most iconic hmm. hotels and locations yeah. in the world. It's yeah. the only seven star, I believe, yeah. in the world. Um, but you were there during the opening. Mm. So how was the actual opening? In incredibly difficult. Obviously, as I said, the first year was a revolving door. You know, chefs came in and out, general managers came in and out, food and beverage. You know, it was, they were, they were shipped out pretty quick. Um, but you've got to remember, Dubai was nothing like it is now. I mean, if you went to the Burj Al Arab, in front of you is the Jumeirah Beach Hotel. If you look to your left, there was the Sheikh's Palace. And then the next thing you saw was the original Hard Rock Cafe, way off in the sand somewhere. That was, there was nothing. There was no marina, no anything down there. It was still just desert. So, I mean, visionary is not is a, is a word I would use. It was really. But was were you busy then? Was it known? Because it was just coming up. Everybody wanted to go in I mean now obviously you have to pay to cross the bridge and all that but everybody wanted to come and see the, the it was you know 
palatial. I mean, it, it, it was totally different from everything. Some, some of it, I mean, if you went to Almontar, I mean, the, the, the decor is quite um, unusual, let's say. Uh, but then it was, I mean, uh, the original design, I believe, and I wouldn't have gone there if you did, the, the, was the, the floor was meant to be glass. Right. Oh, wow. Can you Jeez. imagine? Yeah, that high ups. Yeah. 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 But um, it was busy from day one. Um, everywhere was, but uh, it, it's definitely, the, the food is definitely far better now. You know? And back then, would you say you were working London hours? Or, yes. Or it, it, was, yeah. it was that much? I mean, there's two things. We were definitely, you were coming in on the staff bus in the morning. What I would do, I'd do lunch, then get back on the staff bus, try and sleep in the back seat go back to the staff accommodation, not get off the bus, and then come back to work, go upstairs and start again. So I had like 40 minutes on the, on the back seat sleeping quick, on the quick bus. nap. Power nap, yeah. And other thing then, the ingredients that you got, and I'm sure all the suppliers will agree with what you got back in 99, seemed to be what they couldn't sell in Rouget and places like that and, and Carbon Garden. It was just like, it certainly wasn't the quality of the ingredients that you're getting in Dubai now. Right. Nowhere near, yeah. But how how was that? And I'm assuming that you had a purchasing department. Yeah. So what? I mean, obviously, again, to put things into context, you are coming from, again, uh, Isle of Man, so you yeah. know about produce. Mm. Then London Michelin starred kitchens, you know about produce. Australia, mm. so you know about international produce. Yeah. To then come to Dubai, yeah, open one of the most iconic hotels and restaurants in the world. Mm. You knew far more about produce than the purchasing manager. I think, you know, you still, yes, that's no doubt about it. But obviously the purchasing manager, you know, still today, a hotel purchasing manager does what his job is and he gets what he thinks is the, the best product for the price type of thing, you know. But considering it was such an iconic place... There was no food cost when there I... There was no food cost. Was, so, so you still... Yeah. You had carte blanche, per se. I mean, they wanted gold on the, pl you know, on the dishes and all that sort of caviar. What it, just before I left, they, well, they woke up and said, no, we need a food cost here. You okay. know, so, and, uh, and how many covers is the restaurant for people who don't know? Uh, you, that one you could do, I think, it's a long time ago, maybe 150, 160 type of thing. In one sitting? I think so, yeah. So, yeah, so that's yeah. quite... And it's, the kitchen's very, you know, quite uh, small. But if there was a lot of mise en place done downstairs, came up in the lift right. and, and everything like that. And just, yeah. And how, how long were you there for? Uh, 14 months. Okay. Yeah. And what an eye opener for you. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. There were a, a few <laughs> stories that probably, <laughs> probably not one to, to reveal. We'll those, but, uh, later, later, yeah, later yeah. on at night. Um, I, ha I had to look around. I was going to get sacked. <laughs> I was definitely going to get sacked. Nothing through the, the food scene, but just a bit of a Robin Hood, you know, that yeah. didn't like the way some of the staff were treated in the yeah. early days, you know. They were definitely second-class citizens. Right, the, right. Were. So then, tell me about how the job in Zuma London came up. Because obviously you did your stint within Dubai. Mm -hmm. Successfully opened that. Mm. Have it on the CV. Mm. When did you first hear about Zuma? Well, what Zuma was... Um, so I left the Burj Al Arab, went to run a restaurant called Monsu in, in Madrid. And obviously my, I was married by that time. My wife Farah came, she was pregnant. Uh, so uh, we decided to go back to London. And Reiner, Reiner Becker, who's the owner of Zuma, was my head chef in the Park Hyatt in Sydney. Oh. So he, he's very good at the, 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 and he always keeps in touch with everybody and wow. you know, you, so he rings me up in Madrid. Obviously, my wife is pregnant. I is pregnant. And it's like, do you want to come back to London? Like, yeah, sure. We're opening at a Japanese restaurant. It's like, you're German, I'm British. Why, you know, this is a disaster waiting to happen. And you didn't have a clue about Japanese food No, I food did. I opened, then, I opened uh, Itsu with Mark Gregory in right. London, which is the first Kaiten sushi, but, you know, certainly not the, the, the standard or quality that, you know, Zuma, Zuma was. So I was the head chef. And we had a Japanese head chef. In uh, Zuma. In Zuma. Um, and how was the conversation? I mean, well, he didn't. He didn't last. We, even Ryan, sacked him before, <laughs> before we opened. Because uh, drinking. Okay. You know, he, he was. You know, so um, we opened uh, Zuma in Knightsbridge, 
with only one, I think it was one Japanese guy on the sushi counter who's still there today, Yoshi Um, so, and I, I think, and you know, we'll probably get Ryan out to confirm it. I think there were 14 chefs, and I said, uh, There's not enough chefs here. And he goes, Let's see how it goes. Because even Reiner didn't expect it to be the success it has become. And then, you know, four or five days in, you, you need more chefs. You think so, you know? So we really ramped it up. So in the early days, yeah. So when you first opened, yeah. it was a lunch, dinner, or all day operation. Lunch and dinner. Lunch and yeah, dinner. Yeah. So, but, but did you did you have a little break in between, like th three to five, or it was just open all day? No, uh, in the beginning it was lunch and dinner. Now it's uh, open all day. Okay. Yeah. So it was one of the first sort of concepts of its time in London. You know, the story goes. Obviously, Reiner was getting a haircut. Somebody mentioned Mr. Wani. They got in touch. Reiner obviously was uh, executive chef of the Park Hyatt in Tokyo, and he he really you know, jumped in with Japanese culture with two feet. He loved the pottery, the plates, the food, everything, you know. And um, he could write a, you know, a book on the Japanese pottery and all that sort of stuff. So he just really embraced it. And they sat down and talked about it. And, we, you know, we thought outside the box. The, it's, it's something I've always become. And I think this is one of the things that I, I still carry from, like, wanting to be an archaeologist, you research, you read. And obviously the dishes when we were there were, I mean, the tagline is uh, traditional but not authentic. And and that's what it is. If you're Japanese, you can go in, you can recognize the dishes, but there are tweaks to it, you know. Okay. And that is exactly what we did at Kabara and at Ruya and all these places. So, so when you first opened it, it was busy from the get-go, Zuma? In London? Yes. Yeah, there was a lady called Divya Lavani who's since married uh, Joel Cadbury. And she was of that high society, for want of a better word, high society type of, type of um, place. So from day one, all the, it was the place to go. You know, all her friends came in, the celebrities came in, and the footballers, and, and, right. and so and so. So it was absolutely packed. So you gained couldn't, momentum super quickly. Very, very quickly. We were, it, it was the talk of the town. I think in the first, second year we got, um, was it uh, Square Meals, Best Restaurant, right. and, and, and the accolades was just was amazing. Yeah. And, and, and specifically in London, mm. so you went from 14 chefs to how many by the end you left? Or oh, the way into the 30, you know, 30 odd chefs now. I mean, I don't know what it is now. I had lunch with Reiner there about six months ago. Still excellent. But obviously the company now is not what I sure. remember. Sure. It's, it's a massive, you know, Sven does so much. And, uh, it's a huge, you know, like in Dubai, they have extra chefs that when they open in the mountains or when they open in, in uh, you know, in the south of France sure, and sure, or sure. In, the, in the Mediterranean, then they, these people go there. So it's an absolutely colossal company now, yeah. So how did that journey from London to Dubai come about? Because then, of course, you open Zuma Dubai. Mm. Again, well, no it, you mean know, feet. No, but so when we opened Zuma Dubai, so oh God, when was that? Two thousand seven, I think. Um, the DIC, DIFC was just about to start, and Mr. Wani and Reiner we were going in there, and everybody, because I'd been to Dubai, I still had friends here. Oh, you're mad, mate! You need to put it on Jumeirah Beach in one of the hotels and all that sort of stuff. So, to, Zuma. The DIFC wasn't a dining destination that it is now. Right. We were, we were, there was a couple of sandwich shops in it. But they saw something. I mean, they are geniuses, both of them. The lunch market, dinner market. And from day one, we were absolutely hammered. Uh, it two was, floors? Two floors, absolutely. You, you couldn't get in. Um, and in fact, they had to drop it at one point because the, the, the you know the the fire brigade said, "Look, come on, this is overpacking type of thing." So we were doing six, you know, five, six hundred covers a night sometimes. Yeah, and um, it's still doing fabulously. It's 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 yeah. it's, it's iconic now. It's it's definitely iconic. But from 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 a chef's perspective, yeah, would you say um, that Zuma taught you sort of business sense, if you like? I think. Azuma, yes, but more importantly, Reiner. Reiner was um, uh, uh, probably culinary-wise the biggest influence in my career. You know, obviously from Parkai at Sydney, and then like ten years at Azuma. Mm. Uh, Reiner's one of those guys 
and obviously I'll come up with dishes. He has impeccable taste, impeccable. And wow. so you, so it was your job to sort of come up with dishes for for once for, one for, thing. For, for, well, yeah, to develop, let's yep, say, yep, or lunch yep. special, so on yep. and so forth. Yeah. Um, and you'd have to cook them for him in London or in Dubai or both. Uh, both, both. Okay. I mean, when it was obviously London, uh, and then we. I think the second restaurant that we I went to help open was Hong Kong. So right. Hong Kong was the second, then Dubai, uh, then it's, it's, I think, Istanbul, then Dubai. Okay. Um, but, I mean, I'll tell you an example. There was, uh, I did, you know, the barley miso chicken. I did first, did that on skewers, and, you know. I was on about the 10th, here you go, try that. Still no, nearly there, nearly there. He got 16 versions of that barley miso dish. A chicken dish till he was on the cedar wood till he was happy. I, I still say um, the, the last three I never changed. It was exactly the same, <laughs> and he says no, 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 no. But I was so um, <laughs> upset at this time. So when he finally agreed to it, and you can ask him this story, when he finally agreed to it, I said fine, there. And then I handed him my notice. I said, oh, I said I'm okay. done. You're doing my head, you know? okay. and he's a very good, very good, very good friend. And he just go away, tore it up, and told me to go back to the kitchen. <laughs> But, um, so yeah, and then but, we have. Oh, wow, it. I mean, but 10 years is a serious stint, Colin, in, yeah. for anyone. Yeah. Um, but especially in a place like that. It was such an eye opener. And the only reason I left, because I loved working for the Wani's um, and Reiner in particular, and the people that are around mm. us were just fabulous, you know. I mean, people like Jimmy, who's, you know, Ergo. I mean, he's the best, one of the best barmen in the world and, and, and all this. Alex at BB's was there. Reef was, I yeah. mean, everybody um, w was there. And uh, it was just a great training. And the only reason I left was, I don't want to take sound derogatory or anything. I got fed up with Japanese food. You know, coming up with a new recipe, you just go soy sake mirin. What else can I do? Right. It was quite, quite limiting. Um so when I handed my notice in there, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think my notice was about six months because they didn't think I was actually going to read. I didn't have a job. I just needed a break. But then uh, Caprice Holdings came and offered me the, 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 right. the group uh, Middle East Chef. So I took that. And then it was a case of, you actually are going to leave. And I said, yeah, I just didn't want to do Japanese okay. food anymore. Well, fair yeah. enough. Though. Yeah. Ten years. Ten years. I mean, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So you did Caprice Holdings. Yeah. But then... Then you had a stint at Poland Street in, in Singapore, Singapore. Yeah, with Jason. Which is incredible. Yeah. But then the concept that I really want to sort of speak to you about mm. is what you mentioned previously is Kabara. Mm. So for anyone who didn't have the fortune of going, what was the concept back then? There were three owners and then uh, like Patrick, John and Elmer uh, and Lou, they, they, they came up with this concept. Um, and they wanted a modern Levantine. So a modern Middle Eastern, modern Arabic, you know, all that encompasses that that area. And they approached you? Yeah, I okay. was in, I was in, you know, come back and let's, I mean, the gist of it was, let's do uh, Azuma, but with Middle Eastern food. Right. Fantastic. Okay. Which is basically what it was. Okay. You know, sharing concept, you know. But so Levantine food, and again, in this region, just for anyone yeah. who's listening, yeah. you don't touch the mother recipes. Everything well, no, has to be... Well, basically, you know, I'd, I'd lived in the region a very long time. Uh, so I'm very comfortable with Middle Eastern food, but I'm certainly wanted. So I surrounded myself. You know, Mohammed was from Syria and all the other guys. There were lots of Turkish, there were Egyptians, there were Moroccans and all that. And it was a case of you bring your mother's and grandmother's recipes. Right. And so, so they'd come to me and do it, and we go, that looks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but by God, it tastes amazing. Okay. Yeah. So, so your job was to twist. Just tweak, tweak it, make it look, I mean, even with, with Ruya, I remember that, you know, we did a porridge, you know, the, the, you'd something, <laughs> tasted fantastic. But to make it look like a fine dining uh, or a high-end restaurant, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. I have to say, especially with Levantine food. Yeah. You have to think outside the box. You really have to yeah. think outside yeah. the box. Yeah. Because, you know, how do you make a hummus look fine dining? Yeah. How, how do you make a tabbouleh? Yeah. You know, but because, don't get me wrong, Levantine food is beautiful. Oh, yeah. You know, um, there are so many varieties of flavors and mm. depth of flavors. Yeah. But how did you go about then doing the development to take it to the next stage? 
Well, uh, we, we, we had fabulous, you know, like I say to anybody, you know, a lot of it's a hell of a lot of it is the plates you put it on, you know. And we had some amazing glass plates that uh, the, the boys went out to places like Yemen and some really dodgy places to, to get uh, some fabulous uh, plates and decorations for the restaurant. And we just came up again with dishes that the guys knew from their home countries. And we, you know, we did a falafel. We took it, deconstructed it. You know, we did a, the, the, everybody asks for the lobster cube, the black cod sayadia. Now, black cod sayadia is just you know, borderlining a biryani type of rice and, 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 you know, spice. But the dish it came in, made it with black cod, which every, after Zuma was an iconic. Of everybody course. wants a, a black the cod. The black cod. The black cod. Um, so it's just, and again, coming back to, it's a bit like archaeology. You're reading, you're researching, you're playing, you know, just going through the layers and, you must have learned a lot. Oh, I did. I mean, that's still the dream. I think, I think Kabara was before its time. Because people talk about it yeah, still. Still, still, still. Um, it was before its time. Was the wrong, it was the wrong location. I mean, and it was too big. I mean, there were two floors. Uh, it was one of the most amazing looking restaurants I've ever seen in my life. I mean, especially when you got the, the you know the video screen, which it seems everywhere has got these AI video screens now. Um, but then it was just you could sit and watch, and it was just. So unfortunately, that concept had to close. Well, I I left after. I mean, the the guys that owned it, I think, weren't expecting the accolades and the awards that we got for what they won. They always wanted like they were all three very nice guys. Uh, like Lebanese, they wanted bottle service and a bit more loud music and all that. And we turned it into a fabulous restaurant. They wanted more of a bar with food. Uh, and as, as it started to push more towards the bar element, you know, loud and bottle service, that uh, was time for me. I'm too old and miserable to, <laughs> to, to, do, yeah, to do that, yeah. But then you took the twist mm. and then... You, you know, you, you became the business owner, mm. partner mm. of this fantastic Turkish, mm. modern Turkish concept called Ruya, mm -hmm. which again, mm. super iconic. Mm. Not only was it incredible food, incredible ambience. Yeah. Um, you were in a beautiful location. Oh. How did that project come about? Uh, the Umut came with his father, ate at Kabara. And I remember it distinctly. They came in and they ordered the whole menu. I mean, we're talking four, 35, 40 dishes, you know, for three of them. So you go out to talk to somebody like that. Guys, you can't possibly, no, we want to try everything. So we tried it. And then they basically said, this is exactly what we want to do with Turkish food. Okay, that was it. Then I went and joined John George and, um, thought nothing more of it about a year and a half later they got back in touch we found a side blah 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 do you want to do it and it's still the the passion for that type of food you know the levantine the middle eastern arabic whatever you want to call it it's still the dream it's 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 i don't see why it doesn't get the recognition the same as french japanese um italian all the, the super cuisines of the world it's right up there so but, I had Greg Malouf ah, on the show. That man is a genius. And um, I sort of question him a lot mm. about that specific point. Why is it that in a region such as the GCC or the Gulf, yeah. Persian, whatever you want to call it, with such a rich diversity of flavors mm -hmm. and cultures, mm. why is the food still not recognized as Quite rightly, what you said, Japanese, Spanish, mm, French, yeah. whatever. Number one. Number two, why hasn't had anybody really had the foresight yeah. to make this phenomenal food in a modern way? And I completely agree with you because I, now I only feel right now that we have the talent coming up yep. to start to do this and for the diners to want to have that type there's, of food. There's two things, and I think we made a mistake when we took... so. How do I say? In the Middle East, um, you know, everybody's. You can go to a restaurant and everybody is there. No, nobody, you know, whether the locals, the expats, and all that sort of stuff. Everybody gets on with it. Nobody, you know. 
you take a concept like Kabara and even Ruya, which we, when we moved to London, uh, and because we were so popular here with the, you know, the Emirati, the Saudis and, and the Qatar, all of that sort of stuff, when we got to London, we just packed out with, you know, locals. And if you've got a restaurant in Mayfair paying super, super high end rate, you know, so many times we were selling as much food as Rocker, for example, in the year. I mean, it was very, very busy, but they, nobody's drinking. Right. So, so the spend we, per head. Spend per head is, is a lot lower, and so it's a lot more difficult. So if I ever did it again, I'd really look at a, a two-floor type of, so where you can make everybody happy, you okay. know, because it's, it's very difficult, uh, obviously, when you have a lot of people who don't drink alcohol. But then going back to Ruya, when, when you were developing mm. the ingredients, how, how was that? And, and did you, did you actually go to Turkey? To Six, seven, I mean, it was an ongoing thing. I, um, Rasim Bey, who's Umut's father, I mean, I used to go with him and I went right down the south, uh, which has sadly had the earthquake recently, mm. all that sort of stuff, right to the Syrian border. And when you went, Chen, he was a wonderful gentleman. But when you went to try anything with him, he'd take you into a shop. This place is just for the soup. So you, the guy in front of you on a little gas burner, lamb, chicken, soup. <laughs> Right, next shop. Okay. You know, you'd have 15, 15 dishes for lunch, and it's like, oh, why? I'm, I'm dying, <laughs> you know? But, uh, Sounds horrendous. It was. It, it was. Um, but then, but traveling around Turkey it was It must just, be amazing, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, eye-opening. Yeah. Because you must have learned so much. Yeah. But then taking those learnings mm -hmm. and then taking them here to Dubai mm. yeah. and putting them on a plate. Yeah. Tell me the guest journey when you walked through Ruya, and how was the guest experience? Well, when you walked in, straight away you were confronted by the central kitchen which in Dubai, which contained the, you know, the bread section. So you smelled the bread and everything as soon as you walked in. And um, then the, the kebabs was, were there as well. Uh, so visually, and then you went, I mean, wonderful uh, hotel, uh, Grosvenor House, but it was, so many in the winter, everybody's on the terrace, and in the summer, everybody's inside. So it was a two, 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 two thing. Um, but the, the the whole journey, I mean, there's certainly some iconic dishes that came out of there. That I mean, you see it a lot more now. But when we did the um, the cheese pide, still dream I, about it. <laughs> yeah, and I slow cooked the egg. You know, mm. you know, for seventy minutes at seventy two, uh, and that just just went mental. You know, everybody. You know, and the story that I start, you know, approached earlier. Uh, so, you know, Rasim Bey, when I was in Turkey one time, he came and he said, give me a picture of kes cake, which is basically a gruel, you know, uh, a, bar a barley porridge. And um, there's no way, you know. Next day, another photo. It's the actual national dish that's recognized by the United Nations of Turkey kes cake. So it's like cheddar cheese, it's like champagne. Or right, okay. It's one of those. So, and he was pushing it forward, and then it's like three days, and I'm just like, please, just, just, just make one, you know. And it's obviously lamb neck is in there and everything. So then we slow cooked the lamb and, you know, 24 hours and the lamb neck and, you know, made it look nice and a beautiful, you know, pot that it came in. So, yeah, that's wow. the one I tell everybody to have. But again, it's a very filling dish, you know. I, I had a conversation with Reiner about it, you know, six months ago when we were having lunch, and he said that everything was amazing. But... Some of the dishes are heavy, and you can't get away. There's the the, um, the, the, the polenta with cheese that they eat for breakfast. It's got two packs of butter in it. You know, it's it's, it's like yeah. chef's dream. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Mm. But then, look. The the other thing I wanted to sort of ask you mm. is, you've obviously travelled extensively as mm. a chef. Mm. Is it important? not just as a chef, but also as a hospitality professional mm. to travel? Yes. Because? Opens the eyes. I mean, the best thing, and this is why I do get a little upset. I mean, I personally think catering is the best job in the world. I mean, if you, if you, nobody knows where it is, but if you knew where the Isle of Man was to see where I've been and gone, you know, all my friends still live there. The vast majority of them still live there. Uh, I've seen the world, I've traveled, I've met some amazing people. Uh, and. I think Dubai now 
is, is, is in such a good place because it's a bubble. Mm. And we've got all the, the mixtures of people, you know, the, the guys in the kitchen, the vast majority, you know, Indians, Filipinos, Africans, that, you know, that's that sort of scattering of, say, Europeans and Turks and all that sort of stuff. But they're still prepared. They still see the big dream. They still see the uh, the opportunities. Like every one of my chefs at the Burj Al Arab was Indian. And every one of them is in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. That th This was a stepping stone for them to, 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 to see the world, to get, you know, passports for their children and, and have a better life for, for their children that, 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 that they had. So it's just, a, it's a fabulous place. And all these guys are prepared to do the work. And if you go to see what it's like in Europe now, certainly in Britain, obviously the, the, the double whammy of COVID and the worst one, Brexit, has decimated the. I mean, I, you know, Simon Rimmer's closed his place up north. Thirty-three years that was open because he couldn't afford the rent, the the, the staffing, and all, and all that. There's nobody there. Gavroche. Yeah. Closed. Yeah. Marcus Wary. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it's, it's um, it breaks your heart because the people that want to get, if you want to be the next Gordon, the next Jason Heston, any of these, there's, the only way is hard work. You, there's no shortcuts in, in, in uh, cookery. You cannot. Nobody wants to go back to the, the misogynistic, violent kitchens of the 80s. I'm not saying that. But there's got to be a, a meet in the middle. You can't operate a restaurant if you do, everybody does 7.6 hours a week because you need two teams. And you see so many restaurants in Britain now are only open four days a week and everybody does doubles. So, they, you know, how can you make money? And if you don't make money, restaurant closes if you put the prices up so that you know there's a recession in england there's no other word for it um the restaurant closes because people can't afford to go out because also it's a it's <clears throat> for me i think what was really interesting is during that time i mean during covid is people who weren't necessarily or understood restaurants or cared about restaurants mm. the appetite yeah. for going out physically being in a restaurant mm. talking to a waiter seeing the chef being served yeah it was i remember the restaurants just bounced back almost overnight yeah. Yeah. certainly here um because everybody just wanted to have that sort of human element and i think it doesn't matter for me whether it's a high-end fine dining or a fast casual restaurant mm. you want to have that experience. I think the demographic uh, changed a lot as well. You know, obviously the two, two and a half, three years that nobody was really going out. Everybody learned, you, you saw it here. Could you buy flour for sourdough? No, because everybody, I'm going to make sourdough. Yeah. Or I'm going to make pastas. You know, Banana bread. Yeah. Good, good, <laughs> good ingredients that you can make yourself. So basically what certainly happened, in, I think, in Britain is the lower echelons you've got... They survive, you know, your, 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 your McDonald's, yeah, your, your, yeah. Your, your, you know. And then the higher end survived because the people can't make that. Uh, and a lot of the um, ethnic restaurants did quite okay. But that middle, you know, that middle ground where people, you know, maybe the fish and chips, maybe the, right. the pastas that you can do, you know, yourself, not bad. A couple of bottles of wine and you've got a, a really nice little party with your friends. Uh, they struggled, yeah. So, I think people got better at cooking themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course, and also through social media. Yeah. You know, they, mm. they, they were watching the chefs, so on and so forth, trying it at home. They had the time. Yeah. They, you know, they had yeah. the follow scheme, so yeah. they, it was easy for them to, to, yeah. to get paid yeah. to do it. But the other thing, Colin, I wanted to sort of also get your standpoint on mentorship. Mm. Now, what I mean by that, um, specifically because you've been an owner of a mm. business, how, how would you mentor specifically chefs mm. who are who who would want to open a business mm. but are too afraid they don't have enough knowledge how 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 what would you say to them what would be your advice firstly get the knowledge i mean too many restaurants go by the wayside you've got to really check it out and i mean luckily some of the guys that i worked with in zuma or kabara you know 
they've gone on to bigger and better things. You know, they really have. Whether it's you know, I helped in any way with that is it, de debatable. But um, heading on something that Nick said, you know, when Nick did his uh, podcast, he was a year in every place, and you basically in those days you picked up every little bit of knowledge in that year, take it with you. No, no. I wouldn't look at somebody like a commie chef that, you know, if I got a CV on my desk, he, he was a commie, a demi, a chef de party, a junior sous chef and a sous chef. He wouldn't interest me at all to hire somebody like that. You need to have a broad, you know, when the old days you'd look at all the chefs that you've worked under, oh, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Yeah, this guy's got to be good because you pick up a bit of knowledge from everybody. Because I think I think that's also a key point is that you need people who are going to be solid, who are going to be stay with mm. you or, or see mm. the end game. Yeah. Especially right. these days where there isn't a lot, uh, a lot of chefs anyway. A lot of people in the kitchen, you need somebody who's going to be dependable, for sure. You know they're going to turn up because somebody comes in sick or, you know, one down in a kitchen these days is a huge... Yeah, uh, uh, especially if they're skilled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. Because also there are, as you know, um, the, the number which is banded around specifically within Dubai it's 13 to 14,000 restaurants here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're all different types of demographic yeah. of restaurants, yep. but they're still restaurants. Um, there seems to be a lot of cooks who are not necessarily qualified mm. to do the job, but they still want to be paid incredibly highly. Yeah, I'm sure you've come across even, that. Even more so in, in the UK now. I mean, they come out from college with commie chef. Within six months, they're a demi. Within a year and a half, they're chef to parties, junior sous chefs. Because everybody just wants a pair of hands. So right. if you don't pay me, I know somebody you could. And so you can walk. There isn't, I don't think there's a restaurant in Britain where you couldn't walk in, can I have a job? I mean, is that a difficult? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy, eh? Yeah. Because the, the, the other thing is that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, um, specifically within um, competitions mm. such as YouthX, which is happening at mm. Golf Food, so on and mm. so forth. I'm seeing a lot of particularly young, talented European chefs mm. coming over here mm -hmm. now. And instead of cutting their teeth or, or, or yeah. training in Paris, London, New York, they're actually coming here mm. because we have such phenomenal restaurants. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's... And as you said, the life is good. Yeah, I won't go back. There's absolutely no chance I will I'll go back to the, you know, to certainly the UK while it is like it is. And I think I... I can quote Ricky Gervais, you know, I've lived through the best time, you know, born in the 60s all the way to now. You know, it's just been fabulous. Mm. Starting a career in hospitality now, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I'd, I'd rather do what I did through the, the, right. the hell kitchens of the 80s than now, you know, I definitely would. So then another question I wanted to sort of ask you is, because you've been in region for some time, mm. what are your thoughts on the future of dining here? Obviously, now there's, there's all these awards that have come. You know that's going to have a huge uh, effect. But if you look, let's talk about Zuma. You know, Reiner always said he never wanted a star, and his exact words to me were, uh, "I don't need a, uh, a Frenchman to tell me how to cook." <laughs> so he was never going to uh, apply for, for those things. And they're phenomenally busy. And it's high-end food, but it's not Michelin. You know, Michelin is your Gregoire. Michelin is your uh, Himanshu uh, and that. And there's more and more of them coming. Obviously, the new hotel that's opening, uh, Zabil. One Zabil, well, yeah. one Zabil, you know, and Sophie Pick. The, the, these um, restaurants. Heavyweights. Big players. Absolutely, you know, geniuses in kitchen. Um, but I think Dubai is still a very young country. And I'd love to know what the average age of the person here is. Um, you know, I'm sure it's below 40, the average age for, for, for the whole population. Uh, and they want, a lot of them want a Zuma, want a uh, Shushi Samba, mm. uh, or these restaurants that have a, a nightclub eve excellent food nightclub you buy entertain you know all that it's a package your ultra ultra fine dinings is once twice a year type of thing is the people to are there enough people to 
frequent all the top, top, top restaurants that are coming because it's a very niche market. So let's see. Because also, we're, the other thing that a lot of people who I speak to, they're also asking about the future. What's the talent coming up? Do you see a lot of talent? I mean, young talent coming up? I say to everybody, the, the guys that we get, you know, your Indians, your Filipinos, your Africans, all these are the guys that are so keen so to better themselves, to, to, to really, and, you know, catering is definitely one of the industries where sexuality, color, any of that makes no difference. If you're prepared to work hard uh, and, and, you know, put your head down, the world's your oyster. You know, there's, you can do whatever you want. Um, and I think those guys here, and we're not short of staff as well, which makes a huge, uh, uh, you know, you're lucky that the market is here. You, you can have as many people. So I think the future for Dubai is phenomenal, phenomenal. So talking about the future of Dubai, what's your future now? What sort of projects are you working on? Well, I'm, I'm consulting on a British gastro pub that should open uh, March. That's down in Blue Water. But as I say, the dream, and I'm speaking to a few people, and I'd like to speak to anybody else, <laughs> if you know any millionaires, uh, to do another Kabara. That's the, the big dream. I've been here so long, I, I want to do Middle Eastern food outside the box. Not fusion. I've never done a fusion restaurant in my life. But where you take uh, authenticity and you just tweak it, you know. But I think we need it, Colin. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. we really need I mean, it's, that. It's, it's a real shame, you know, obviously Mohammed uh, Ali. Doing uh, a phenomenal job. Phenomenal job putting, the, the, you know, the region on the map uh, and, and some of these places. But if you come to Dubai and you say, what did you eat? Oh, I went, had a fantastic Italian, fantastic French great Greek restaurant, lovely Japanese, and you haven't experienced anything of the culture here, it's a waste of a trip, isn't it? Well, you really, totally. You really should. Uh, and so many of the restaurants, Middle Eastern restaurants, are just your standard Lebanese type of thing. So there's far more to it than that. Yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah. Well, Colin, look, now we've come to the dreaded quick fire round. Oh, have a glass of water. So, so yeah, I'll get, I'll get, get yourself ready with the water, Chief. So... First things first, sweet or salty? Salty. Fish and chips or tapas? Oh, tapas. Uh, no, fish and chips. <laughs> fish and chips. Yeah, yeah, I'm lying. I'm lying. All right. This is a trick one specifically for you. Mm. Queenie scallops or Manx kippers? Scallops. Queenies. <laughs> Queenies. Yeah. In well, fact, actually, the moors, so the traditional one, there's two traditional kipper factories on the Isle of Man. One, due to the, you know, the, it's close. So we're just down to one. You know, they don't dye the kippers. They're absolutely fabulous. Really? So we've only got one traditional. I mean, I don't want to say, but Scottish kippers quite often contain dye. Ours never do. Wow. Yeah. Only, you heard it here first. Only kippers sold in Harrods and Mugs. Yeah. <laughs> Is it quite, are they quite smelly? The, the, the oh, factory, I, the uh, island? Yeah. You can smell them from miles away? Or what? Oh, if you're in Peel, you can smell them, yeah. Wow. Smoking shed, yeah. Still amazing. Mm. Uh, spicy or pickled? Uh, my wife is Indian. We've been married 23 years now, and um, my spice tolerance is pretty pathetic. <laughs> for, 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 so I would definitely say pickled. Okay. Yeah. I'm surprised, Colin. I thought you would have been... Uh, yeah, yeah. You know. But it's very funny, because I've got two boys, Ewan and Niall. Uh, Ewan looks slightly more Indian, but his tastes are very European. Right. Niall is as whiter than me, he's al al albino, <laughs> and he's chili tolerance, and his love of Indian food is off the charts. Wow, yeah, 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 wow. Yeah. Yeah. Who would you say are your top three culinary heroes, and they don't need to be chefs? Oh. Well, for me personally, I'll always say Rainer Becker, mm -hmm. you know. Um, to, to, to. I think I'll throw in John Tarod. I know yep. he's on the TV now, but John's a, a, an old friend. He brought me back to London to open Mezzo back in the day. Uh, and we're still, you know, in contact now, good friends. So he'd be in there. And uh, I would say, yeah, Anthony Bourdain. Oh, I still listen to his pod, pod, podcast. Once I've listened to James O'Brien walking out, I usually listen to Anthony or you on the way back, you know, so it's... Uh, yeah. But that guy, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, That's my, that would have been my ideal thing. Travel, see the world. Yeah. But some of the things he ate, I'd think pass at that. Yeah, I don't have that uh, yeah, spice tolerance. Uh, right, as of right now, mm. 
what would you say are your top three cuisines that you love to eat? Oh, uh, Middle Eastern, yeah, whether that definitely uh, Vietnamese, and I would say British. You know what? Uh, it's the first time we've had yeah, no, Vietnamese. Yeah. First time we've had British. Well, British is so under uh, valued, you know. And I, I feel really bad because, and I will blame Brexit. I don't, my wife told me not to mention politics, but I will. It's okay. The, London and Britain, in particular, was at the pinnacle of the world food scene. You know, it really had gone. And sadly, now because of you know everything, it's starting to, mm. I think, come down the other side. Mm. And countries like Dubai are obviously yes. on the way up, so we're great. But uh, top quality British ingredients cooked well. People like you know Hicks and yes. and, and Tim from you know for Caprice and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Fallow is uh, f- what they're doing in, in London is fantastic. And they're opening another place. Another place, and um, hope they come here. Uh, yeah, I think the food scene is. You know, but look, I think that when it, when it comes to the British part of our side of things. Um, it pertains back to your childhood, mm. you know, um, having top quality ingredients mm. equals top quality yeah. food. Totally. It's totally. quite basic. And what my pet hate is, is supermarkets. Now, when I was growing up, even little villages had a fishmonger's a butcher's uh, and a you know, bread and right. all that sort of stuff. Now everything, and I understand people have to work hard and, you know, and there's two people working now, so... Everything's put into one big supermarket. The fish is in plastic trays. The meat has already been prepared. You know, the skill levels on there. So how do you make great food from average ingredients? Right. So, you know, it's a, it's and if you go to Italy, you go to France, you go to, are they better chefs than us? No. Do they eat better? Yes. Yes. Because they'll sit around a table mm. with their families and, 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 and eat properly. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. I yeah. agree. Now, Colin, I want you to go into your memory bank. My age, that's a bit... Um... <laughs> <laughs> what would you say mm. is the funniest ever, or for you, the funniest kitchen incident that you've either seen or been involved in? It could either be front of house or back of house. And if you don't want to, for liable reasons, you don't need to name names. Oh, no, I'll name <laughs> I'll spill the beans because uh, they've involved me. Whether they're funny, I mean, at the time, at the I, w- time I, I wasn't laughing. Obviously, yeah, but now, yes. So uh, we opened, uh, there's two that jumped, jumped to mind. One was in London and one was here. So we opened Mezzo. You know, I was upstairs. Uh, Chris Galvin, fabulous chef, was downstairs. John Tarode was running it. Um, you know, last time I had drinks with John, it was like we sacked a hundred people in the first year, and that, and probably twice as many of that walked out. It was just mental. <laughs> the whole concept was um, minimum uh, fridge storage. There was very uh, not many fridges. Prep served for lunch. Prep served for dinner. You know, it was one of those places for servants. And it was modern Greek. Uh, downstairs was French brasserie. Upstairs was Asian. Okay, um, and. You're doing a thousand covers a day, upstairs and down. It, it was it was just mental. That's a monster, man. Yeah, and we practiced as you do. You know, you offend friends and family. Uh, it was um, uh, fifty people, a hundred people, hundred. You know, but we never certainly didn't practice on more than a hundred and fifty. And then the opening day, the opening day. Um, the queue was, I don't want to be rude, but the queue was like a, a, the unemployment office in Liverpool. It went down the street to get into this place. And obviously we didn't have enough food. I pulled the fire shutters down on the door. It was, I had, you know, the, your docket grabbers, there was four on a board. And I still had a pile like that underneath me to my teacup. It was, it, it was the worst. Yeah, it was the worst one. And then the other one that springs <laughs> to mind was Kabara. And I've never done it since because I'm terrified. So it was a... I don't know. Do we still have dry days? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm sure. not sure. But when we still had dry days, uh, it was a dry day. So we closed the upstairs kitchen at Kabara, and I sent half the guys home. There was 20, 30 people on the book. You know, carried on mise and blessing. How many's on the book? 100. 150, 200, 250. 
and there's about eight guys in the kitchen. I had people by the throat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, that was probably one of the worst things. And, uh, you know, now it, you know, since then, Chef, it's dry night. We're not going to be busy. Nobody's moving. Nobody. <laughs> no, I'm never going through another. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was hell on earth. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. That must have been horrid. It was. And one, it was very funny. One of the chefs that I sent home came in and had a drink at the bar and then came into the kitchen to see if I was okay. Because the language was yeah. colorful and it was like a rainbow. And, did um, he come in and... Ca- and, and well, he did the, until the I had it. On? No, no, I had him put around the throat because he was laughing. <laughs> so, like, yeah. 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 And so the, the lesson there is... Um, if you get sent home, stay away. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. number one. Number mm. two, uh, never laugh uh, when the chef yeah. is busy. But, you know, <laughs> I, think, I think Nick said something on the line. Everything is good and bad. Of course. You know, you, you just... These are the stories when you're old. If you're lucky enough to get old, you know, you sit around the table with your mates yeah, and talk, isn't it? You know, about... you know, um, yeah. I mean, again, I was fortunate enough to work with Nick at Gordon Ramsay at Claridge's, yeah, Luigi Vespero, yeah, uh, Tristan. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. and you know, back then there are thousands of stories. Oh yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> you know, but we, we're all best mates. You know, yeah. also uh, when 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 Scott was here. Yeah. So um, and it shapes you. Yeah, really. And I think, yes, we don't. And I said, I said it before, or I touched on it before. We don't want to go back to the, you know, no. the eighties kitchens, the misogyny, the violence, and all that. But it's it's too sanguine now. You know, it's you need to meet in the middle where the people that own the restaurants can make the money. Absolutely. And there is only one way to to, to do well in this in this job is is to work hard. Yeah. If you want to get to the top, you work hard. It, if you just want to stay a commie or a chef at a party, that's fine. Mm. You do your job, roll up, go home. But if you really want to get on, it's all hard work. Now, the final question for the quick fire, Colin, is what advice would you give to a 16-year-old Colin Clegg? Pretty much exactly what I did. Uh, walk out the door and work with as many good people as you can. Keep your eyes open, work hard, and see the world. Travel. Yeah. I think that's phenomenal advice. Yeah. Not just for 16-year-old Colin Clegg, yeah. but for anyone. Yeah. I mean, I'm way into my 50, 50s now. I can still learn off, you know, I, I'll tell you what it was. I was at the Ritz the other day, and I saw something on, 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 in a book or something about, a, you know, the hopper. I said to one of the Sri Lankans, Oh, well, get me one of those pots. This is fantastic. I've got, I've got ideas of what I want to do with this, you know. He comes back and it's this. It looks like aluminium, but it's obviously not. It's like cast metal rough and everything with a wood. Look, it's, it's fabulous. It's in my house. And um, so, yeah, the, the hopper. So he was showing me how to do it and, ev- and everything like that. Just because you're, you know, executive chef, mm. culinary director, you can learn something every day. Yeah. I and, think that's the most amazing thing about yeah. our job, Yeah, to be honest. Yeah. Is being also... Well, the other thing, Colin, I wanted to say is also being humble enough mm. to, to recognize that you, you have that vision or you, or you can see a dish that you can twist and turn mm. and, and to have your team come and show you something, you know, oh, yeah. because I agree with you. I, I, we can learn a recipe from anybody, yeah. you know, um, but, but I think that's also an amazing trait. Mm. And read. Read, read lots. Yeah. I think um, read, reading... Uh, enhances your imagination more than en- the, the, anything else, you know? If, so if you read, read as much as you can uh, and take that into your other parts of your life and it's, it's definitely a beneficial. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Now, Colin, for anyone wanting to get hold of you through social media, mm. how can they do that? Uh, I think, what is it? Is it Manx Chef or Chef Manx? Mm. What I'll do is I'll put everything yeah, in the put show every, notes. Put, yeah, uh, they can always get hold of me there. Um, yeah, you, you can put my LinkedIn. In. Yeah, I'm on there, but there's about three of them because I keep forgetting my password. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I'll put Instagram. And then yeah, I'll put Instagram. Out, yeah, and uh, yeah, everybody can. Yeah, especially any millionaires that want to open uh, the very Kibara. good. <laughs> very, very millionaires, yeah. uh, restaurant groups. Yeah. you know any of those. Yeah, that's the but, dream. I, I, I definitely have one, and one more. I think. Fabulous Middle Eastern restaurant in me. The, I'm sure. The imagination's going into overdrive. Which is yeah. exciting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, Colin, if we just 
have a, a, a quick recap of mm -hmm. what we went through is your your food memories which i love growing up on that beautiful island which I'm, i have not had the opportunity of visiting but now i want to go in the summer you know <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you. so now i really want to yeah. um to then stepping away going to a pro kitchen in london for mm. the first time to then australia dubai opening the burj al arab iconic place caprice holdings zuma of mm. course kabara ruya why travel is you, so important yugoslavia during yugoslavia. a war during a war yeah. israel during a war i mean, I uh, mean it, yeah. you've, you've it, been everywhere it, it makes uh, what's it character building character building, character building. exactly think, yeah, so. but look um on behalf of myself and the entire team at the chef jkp podcast we just want to say thank you first of all for making such an incredible impact in the industry making such an incredible impact within the region doing so much for so many chefs inspiring all of us it's really phenomenal what you're doing um, and really a massive thank you for taking the time to be on the show it's really appreciated it's uh, very kind of you to, to say so obviously it's wonderful i do listen now that you showed me how to use a podcast I, <laughs> you, you need to get, tell, tell everybody that um yeah no it's, it's it's been a lot of fun i wasn't as nervous as i thought i'd be because it's very easy talking to friends um but it's been a pleasure thank you very very much Thank you so much.